about 10 minutes to do the exercise. Uh, and as we're finishing handing out, if anyone ends up not having a piece of paper, then uh, I want you to let me know. Okay. We're almost finished handing out. We can actually even start uh, pairing up. The goal is for each client to be paired with one lawyer. So now take a look at your sheet, find out whether you're a client or a lawyer. All right? And if you have an opposite next to you, then that's the person you're going to be paired with. You, it may be someone behind you. So sit next to, you're going to need to have a good conversation. So sit next to, if you're a lawyer, sit next to a client. If you're a client, sit next to a lawyer. Everybody needs to be paired up. They are already paired up. They are already paired up. Does anyone not have a pair? Anyone not have a partner? Does anyone not have a partner? Please raise your hand if you do not have a partner. Yes? Are you all pairing? Good, okay. Well, actually, why don't you, you can go back there so, it might, so that you can have a little bit more quiet conversation. Everybody is paired up, okay. So I'm gonna give you two minutes to read your script. The lawyers are not gonna need that much time, but the clients need more time to read their script. I'm giving you two minutes to read your script. Go ahead. Don't share it with each other. Clients, you cannot let your lawyer see what's on your piece of paper. Keep your sheet private. Yes. <laughs> Let's do one more minute and we're going to get started. About 30 more seconds and we'll get started with the exercise. We'll wait for the instructions to be translated into Georgian.
So now everyone, everyone has their, understands their role. Um, you'll have 10 minutes to conduct the interview, that, the lawyers. 10 minutes to conduct your interview with your client. Doesn't seem like a lot of time, but sometimes 
interviews have to be short. Sometimes we don't have a lot of time. And even though it isn't a lot of time, I expect you to conduct a full interview from beginning to end as if you were doing it in, in your office. Make it a real interview. Uh, so a beginning, a middle, and an end. Uh, I will give you a three minute warning, or Echo will give you a three minute warning to let you know when you have three minutes remaining and, and it'll be time to wrap up. And then afterwards, what we'll do is to deconstruct your interview and we'll go through some slides and look at a framework for interviewing and talk about your experience as we go through the slides. So to set the stage, the client has now come into your office and you're getting ready to start the interview right now. You may begin. Lawyers, start interviewing.
Uh, well, first goal is to get to know your client and understand what he is up to and what he needs and how can I help the client. That's right, and that, that actually you actually mentioned several goals there. One is to get to know the client, to build rapport, to uh, connect with your client. The other is to find out what the client objectives are. Um, another goal is to find out if you can actually help the client. So those are three independent goals. Any other goals that people can think of? Anyone have any goals to add to those three goals that have been mentioned? We have a hand back there. Yes. Um, so that might go to, you may have been getting to, in, in uh, finding out the background, that's a broad kind of big picture, what is uh, this person about, but also dealing with other lawyers. I think you're getting to conflicts as well. Um, is there a situation where this um, person has, maybe has another lawyer, uh, what is, or, or has dealt with another lawyer in a similar context? So, yes. Yeah, I wanted to, to say exactly the same. I will make a, a conflict uh, check. Mm -hmm. The first goal will be first conflict check. Mm -hmm. Yes, to make sure there isn't a conflict. Let's let's have uh, one or two more. Marketing yourself. Ah. Yeah. Well, selling your abilities maybe. Sure. And for more and more. Um, and determine not only what you the client work. comes to you for, but more that uh, she or he may need. That's right. So you're not just trying to, uh, if you can help this client, you don't just want this particular uh, representation in this context, but you want this client to keep on coming back to you for, for legal help. And that's another reason why it's important to have a good interview. Because if it's a bad interview, the chances are the client's not going to do that. <laughs> Yes, and that gets to, are you going to be able to help the client? Is the client, um, and we'll get to how do you ask these questions to dig a little bit deeper, but the goal is to get enough information in the interview to determine whether you want to represent. We'll have one last question and then we're going to move from the, from the goals. Anu, chen chen khwashi client sad mo argi businessi kono thul sa dar registre re bolli argi ko arche poso tar an arche intimen sar met ato gatet tar gamo orbe ro ato gatet tar nur tiro tova ar koni ya samar tle bri ro thau isi businessi kamar thuli ar konda mesh shew thau aze mas tha brand is dar registre re bar ogort brandat samar tle bri ro thau isi businessi kamar to thul sami u khwa dau tham isa mas main sar kono tsudi shew mosa wali magram brandat registrace is shew khwashi. Mes factori da wana khe masro upro met she musawals moutan da prenda registracia vidre manamde is rom tuitona zarbovda khod thawis an produksias da ayam misli da wana khe. And the reason I'm stopping you is because those are some details we're going to get into in just a few minutes. I want to stick with the goals right now, but that's interesting information that we're going to get to. So, you all mentioned many of the goals that are stated here, building rapport with the client, making that connection, clarifying the roles and expectations of the relationship, gathering facts. We talked about gathering facts. Um, something that people didn't mention was identifying relevant documents and information, 
Uh, that can be very important because there may be sensitive information uh, that needs to be dealt with right away. Uh, determining whether you can help, that was one of the first things that was mentioning, mentioned. Defining the scope of the relationship. Maybe it's going to be very limited representation for a particular reason, but determining that. And then setting short-term short and long-term goals. So now that we've dealt with the goals, we're going to go to uh, the, what I call the seven stages of the interview. Now, seven is not a magic number. You might decide that you want ten stages of an interview. It really doesn't matter. In my experience, I have determined that these really are the stages that we go through uh, in successful interviewing. But you might decide to edit this later and add some things or take some things away to make it work better for you. But the stages of the interview, the first is preparation, and that's pre-interview preparation. We'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, the introduction, which is very important. Have you all, do you all know the saying that uh, about a first impression, you can never uh, have a second impression. It's always the first impression. Now I'm not, I'm not saying it correctly. You have one chance to make a first impression. You have one chance to make a first impression. Thank you. That's right. You have one chance to make a first impression. That goes to, to does this person want to come back to you? So establishing rapport is very important. The overview. That is where the client is telling, um, giving the client's statement. We used to call it the client's story, but that could be, uh, that could imply that you're expecting the client to tell some untruths because it's called a story. But you really want the client to tell you why the client is there. Fact development, and that, that really is where the lawyer has the responsibility of asking the deeper questions. We'll get to that. And then the summary, um, options that are available, and then the action plan. Now we're going to go through, uh, quickly go through those stages, but it seems very logical, very linear. Who has had an interview where it just didn't happen in a very linear pattern? Anybody have an interview that kind of turned on its head? That's right. Um, it happens all the time. It's happened to me several times where I've started out with my wonderful introduction that I have planned and the client launches into a story before I'm ready to get there and, and won't stop because the, the client is so passionate about what they came there for. Well, what does that mean? That means that we have to be flexible and understand that things are not necessarily going to go exactly as we planned, but if we have a framework, we always can come back to our framework and know the steps that we still need to get through. And that's the important thing. So, here we go. So, pre-interview preparation. You all didn't have a chance to do any pre-preparation for this interview. I sprung this on you. You didn't know it was going to happen. But, lawyers in particular, uh, what would you have done after you, after the client called you and scheduled the meeting? Between that moment and the client making uh, himself or herself to your office, what would you have done to prepare? Yes, and Make some research about the person. Make some research about the person. Some research about the person, very good. Mm -hmm. uh, check if uh, there is a conflict of interest with the client. That's right. Uh, you can, you have the person's name, so you can do at least a preliminary conflict check. You can find out a little bit about the person, even if you just Google them. What else? What else would you have done for pre-interview uh, preparation? We have a hand here. I can just give you well, obviously, I would check uh, what business this person is doing and, you know, prepare myself a, a little bit about this. Absolutely. Absolutely. This person, in this case, they are going to be, you at least know, as a lawyer, that they are going to be making clothing. Um, and we think pet clothing. You at least have that information. Do a little bit of research about that area. That's exactly right. So, in advance, gather information about the clients and the client's issue. We've gotten that one. Check. Check for possible conflicts. Prepare a comfortable setting for the interview. How often do we do that? Um, make sure that the room is um, going to be a good temperature, whether the seating is appropriate, whether there's going to be water available. And what if, what if the client has special needs? Does, has anyone in preparing for an interview asked the client, the potential client coming in, are there any special needs that I need to be aware of? 
Has anyone ever asked that question? Have you asked that question? Yes. Gathering information about the person is one thing that we're going to do. But that last one, let's get back to this last one on, um, on the special needs. That's actually very important, and it's something that most of us miss. We just don't think about it. But how valued would a person feel knowing that before you even get to their office, before they get to your office, you're concerned about whether they have any special needs. So that's very important. Now, the introduction. Lawyers, how did you start the um, interview? What was one of the first questions that you asked? Uh, sorry, uh, I missed uh, uh, the question about the special needs. I would ask the client if uh, the client needs, for example, parking facilities mm -hmm. to come to the office yes. and preserve the parking lot. Very good, yes. And that's, that's the kind of accommodation we're talking about. Lawyers, how did you start your interview? What was the first question that you asked if you were a lawyer? The name. You asked the name? Yeah. What's your name? Okay. Yeah. What else? How else did you start the interview as a lawyer? Well, first of all, by thanking them to choose us and to be here. And secondly, what, what do they really need? I mean, who they are, obviously, I already know because I Google them. Yeah. And I know their name already, so I would probably ask what, whether they need to be here. Okay. What else? Oh, you've got to answer up here. You would recheck. Yes. It's easy to find out about a person these days. Uh, maybe some informal uh, talk, like about the weather and you know sports and stuff. No, you laugh, but that is very important. That is how we build rapport, and that's very important. When someone comes in, I tell my my clinic students all the time before they're doing their interview. Please don't have the first thing you say to someone after you've done your introductions, okay, why are you here? Why? Because some people have never been, stepped into a lawyer's office before, and they are terrified. And or their situation is fearful to them. And so what they need is to become comfortable. They need to have a sense that I can talk to this person. One of the easiest ways to do that is to as we say um, in the States, they have little icebreakers. Ask, it's, you know, beautiful day today, or did you have any problems parking, or something like that. Who asked, um, how was the trade show? Anybody ask that? How was the trade show that you've been to? Right, so you had information that the client was coming from a trade show. It's very, very important. That is the best way to build rapport with a client, is to do something like that. So for this introduction stage, we're going to um, uh, we're going to be making a connection. Who's in the room? The reason that I have that is that it's important to determine um, if someone who's not supposed to be in the room is in the room, or if someone who needs to be in the room is not in the room. So um, a lot of times we have clients coming to our clinic, and they've had someone drive up, drive them, and that person who has driven them comes into the room. Well, guess what? What, do we, what kind of issue do we have right there? Do we have an issue? We, well, we have an extra person, and if I'm going to be make, creating an attorney-client relationship, what problem does that extra person pose? A confidentiality problem, that's right. And so you have to be prepared for that. Maybe there's someone who needs to be in the room. Who asked whether there were going to be any other owners in this business? Did anybody ask that question? Any lawyers? Very good, in the back. Ask whether there were going to be any other owners. Maybe someone else needs to be in the room who's not in the room. Okay? And by the way, you all will get copies of these slides when, uh, when we're done. I didn't want to give them to you now because you have all the answers to the questions that I'm asking. Okay, who is the client? Um, it could be in some situations that the client already is an entity. And so are you going to be representing the entity or are you going to be representing an individual? It's important to know who the client is, who is going to be your client. Um, again, establish rapport. I can't say that enough because it's something that we ignore too much. Clarify the relationship. And that's part of building the expectation of uh, your role as the lawyer and their role as the client. And then fees. Who talked about fees at the very beginning of the meeting? 
Anybody mention fees? Did anybody say, since this is an uh, introductory, I'm going to give you half of my uh, fee structure right now. I'm going to, instead of charging $100 an hour, it's just $50 an hour for this 10 minutes. And then if I, if, if we uh, retain you, then it'll be $100 after. Any mention of fees? Okay. Yes, you did. Well, my client asked me um, how much would she pay for okay. the 10 minutes. And then I said, it's free for the first 10 minutes, so, so that would better be fast. <laughs> and then I would send, him, send her the prices. Okay. All right, well, we'll talk about that second part of sending the prices. But that was excellent. Now, should the client be the one to have to raise the issue of fees? No. That is something that at the beginning of the relationship, the client has a right to know what they're going to be charged. And I think it's great for a lot of times for a short consultation like this, it's a reduced fee or even free sometimes. But the client needs to know that. Okay, now we're talking about the client's statement of their goals or problems. We talked about that a little bit, and I asked some, some questions uh, of you. Let's see. Um, this is where we get the big picture. Uh, this is where we ask open-ended questions and continue to, to um, uh, to establish rapport. What are some of these big open-ended questions that were asked? Just a few, because we're running out of time. I want to make sure that my colleague directly has enough time for his interview, for his uh, presentation. What are some open-ended questions that were asked to get kind of a big picture of what was going on that the lawyers asked? And clients, what did they ask you? Nobody had any big questions? The main questions were, uh, who are you, what kind of business do you carry out, uh, what kind of assistant, legal assistant do you need, uh, what is uh, your term, whether it is a short term or long term relationship, and uh, other general uh, questions. Okay, alright, good. Um, and those are, those are general questions, but it, th those are even getting a little bit specific about the business. This is the time where you actually do find out a little bit about the person. Um, have you ever started a business before? Uh, and if it did it, she asked. Yeah. Very good. And then she must have found out about those failed businesses. What lawyers found out that there were some failed businesses? Yeah. Yes. That's very good. How long have you been in business? And ask about the failed businesses. It's those big picture questions. Who found out? Any lawyers find out, find out that this is a new parent who has a three-month-old at home? Very good. At least one hand went up. And that is, again, connecting with the person, getting to know. Uh, something about the person. These little details are important because it's important for the client to know that you not only care about their business and taking care of this one matter, but you want to build a relationship with them. Um, okay, fact development. What do we mean by fact development? And to, to move this along, um, this is where you start asking those detailed questions. And when we talk about fact development, we're really talking about, I like to talk about building blocks. You're literally having blocks and building on top of another. You are creating a structure. And for the lawyers, you're creating your theory of the case at this point. So we've gone from asking very broad, open-ended questions, have you ever started a business before, and things like that, to um, very specific questions about what, what were those businesses? Uh, how long did they last? Were they successful? I have a question about this um, family thing you mentioned. Isn't it a little bit awkward to ask a person you met like five minutes ago, how is your daughter feeling or whatever? Like, do you touch up on a family issue at the first meeting? Is it okay? Well, it, you know, that really depends, and it depends on how it comes up. That may come up, and the client may have brought up the fact, oh, I'm so, so, so sorry, I have a three-month-old at home, and then you can carry on from there. But you're right, you do have to be careful about getting into that very, very personal realm. Um, it is safer until the client uh, raises the issue, and then it's okay yeah. to, um, you know, to maybe have a follow-up question or to say something that's sympathetic 
um, about that particular situation. But it's a very good point. You do have to be careful of those very personal questions. Um, but here is where you want to make sure that you're in control of the interview. You want, you want to develop a chronology at this point. And we know that clients don't necessarily speak in chronological order. You know, you're not going to get the story from A to Z in that order, right? You're going to get, you know, M and then Z and then B. And it's up to you to take those blocks, move them around, and put it in an order that makes sense to you. And again, where you can start developing a theory of the case. At this point, you're going to start thinking, wow, would it be better for this person to be a limited liability company or a corporation? Or maybe they don't need an entity. In the United States, you can just be a sole proprietor and not have an entity. Um, and it depends on the risks and what we advise um, about that. So that's where you're asking those types of questions. And then your summary. What are we doing in the summary? Um, it's up to the lawyer at that point to be able to summarize back to the client the relevant facts. So you've had to have kept good notes. Now, if you're the kind of person who needs to write everything down and get everything, you may need a note taker in the room. Maybe your secretary or a junior um, attorney needs to be in the room with you taking those notes because you want to be connecting with the client. And if you're doing this the entire time that the client is talking, that's not going to build a rapport at all. Um, so you want to be able to summarize those relevant facts that you've heard. Um, characterize the, the client's need or the client's uh, problem. So you want to start, a, this is what I've heard you say, and you want to start a business, but these are some of the issues. You've had failed businesses before. You have a tax liability. Who found out about the tax liability? Yeah, you've got this tax liability. What do we need to do about that? Um, sometimes clients need a reality check. I know probably the majority of our clients need a, a reality check. They have grandiose ideas about what they want to do, and I'm sitting there thinking to myself, do they know they have no money? Do they know that there's a competitor in the market that they have to deal with? Sometimes the client needs a reality check, and it's up to the lawyer to put things in perspective, and this is a good time to do it. Um, get confirmation from the client that the, um, the, your understanding of the facts and objectives are correct. And if agreed, at this point, it's a good time to sign a retainer. Um, you haven't given legal advice yet. You are gathering information. You've had a back and forth conversation. You have a good idea of what's going on. And maybe you've decided, I need more information before I can decide whether I want to take on this whole project. So maybe you sign a limited retainer with a limited scope. And you decide, I'm going to uh, do a bit of this, and, and, and I want to do a little bit more fact investigation and more evaluation before I take on more of it. So you decide, what's the appropriate scope? And relevant authorizations, if this is um, a situation where you have to get health records or employment records, this is a good time for the client to sign the release authorizations that are needed for that. You don't want to have to go back and call the client the next day and say, oh, by the way, I need you to come back and sign all these authorizations. So that's a good time to do it. Um, stage six, now we've entered into the client, um, the attorney-client relationship. Now it's starting to, uh, time to talk about legal and non-legal options, but don't rush to judgment, right? Because um, some theories that you may have formulated in your mind preliminarily may need to be adjusted later. But maybe there's some non-legal options. Maybe this person really needs a business plan and you can help with the business planning or you can refer them to someone to do a business plan if you're not able to do it yourself because maybe that would help overall. Um, but what are the legal options? And very preliminarily assess the consequences and the risks of those options. Uh, this is a good time to talk about short and long term courses of action. And uh, what we're gonna do immediately is to uh, take care of your tax liability and then the next stage will be to set up a legal entity for you or to write a business plan and the next stage. Um, and then advise on immediate issues of concern. Well, uh, the client had a conversation with a French business, uh, with the French clothing designer. Did they sign a contract? You need to see that, right? 
Um, maybe that's an immediate issue of concern. Maybe there's a lease that they've already signed. I don't know about you, but my clients usually come to me after they've signed a lease and then want me to review it. And, you know, sometimes we need to deal with that, that issue immediately. So what needs to be dealt with now and what can wait until later? And stage seven, my final stage here, is the action plan. Set a specific timetable, okay? So that the client knows exactly what's going to happen and so that you know, you're, there's a meeting of the minds about all of the next stages. This is more than setting short-term and long-term goals. This is very specific. Next Thursday, I will call you. Or next Thursday, we'll meet again in my office. Clarify homework for the client. I don't have a client go out of my office without, or if it's a student situation in my clinic, without giving them homework. It may be, uh, I, need to, I need you to send me electronically or drop off at my office the uh, lease agreement that you want to sign. I need you to do, I have the client do something. Why do I do that? Why do I always give the client homework? Yes, to keep the client, um, is it okay for you to contact them via email? Who else is on that email account? Client confidentiality. Can you call and leave, can you call them on their mobile phone? Can you leave a message on the mobile phone? Do they share that mobile phone with anyone? Um, we have, we need, you need to be clear about the appropriate lines of communication that are going to ensure client confidentiality. Uh, and confirm that the client understands all of this. You want the client to, however, you, if you want them to repeat back to you, uh, but you want the client to make sure that the client has an understanding of all of these important things. Okay, just two more slides. Post-interview actions. I strongly encourage you within 24 hours of that interview to do your memo to the file, summarizing in detail that meeting. That's really important because I don't know about you, but I'm not going to remember it much after that. And the details are going to get a little bit blurry. So uh, tw within 24 items, get your calendar out and calendar those items that you need. If you said that you're going to have the client a, a summary of the legal options by next Tuesday, Put it on your calendar, have a tickler on Monday saying, I need to get that to the client tomorrow. Make sure that you're being held accountable. And communicate a course of action and other relevant information to the client in writing. Meaning, do a summary to the client within 48 hours. Let them receive something from you to let them know that they are a valued client, that you're paying attention to their legal matter. And then the last slide is, uh, slide is considerations during the interview. Again, what's your nonverbal communication? Are you sitting there writing notes not looking at the client? Are you answering the phone during that meeting? Are you checking your email while you're talking to the client? Are you interrupted? Those are all things that send messages to the client. Um, the timing of communication. Sometimes we have bad news or embarrassing news to share with the client. Best not to do that at the very beginning. <laughs> Establish that rapport first, and then give that bad news toward the end once the client trusts you a little bit. Personal appearance. It matters what you look like. It matters how you present yourself to the client. Um, acknowledgement of limitations. Okay, I understand that you've got this tax liability, but I don't do that type of work. I'm going to refer you to someone who does. Don't pretend that you can do something that you can't. It's not, it never ends up well. Trust me, it doesn't end up well. So acknowledge your own limitations. Cultural issues, I do a whole class on this, so I'm, I'm just gonna very, very briefly touch on it to say that understand um, your, your own lens. Have an understanding of the lens that you see things through, your own biases, and how that might affect your interaction with someone. And don't run away from it, you really need to acknowledge these are differences I have with the person or these are similarities and it might impact my representation. And then work on um, being able to be an effective lawyer for this person, um, maybe despite those things. Ethical issues, you know, we dealt with some ethical issues at the beginning, confidentiality, you have somebody else in the room that shouldn't be in the room, how do you deal with that? Or other ethical issues that could come up. I kind of sped through that, and I'm sorry about that, but uh, questions? No, no, about ethics. About ethics. Oh. Well, okay, thank you. I guess when you 
uh, contact with a client and uh, you have not uh, signed an engagement and you are in the pre-contractual pre pre uh, phase and uh, give a client the homework and then and the client insists you to represent him or her but you finally uh, reject representations but the and you may be uh, violating ethical issues uh, if you decide not to take the yeah mm -hmm. but uh, you agreed to give a client a homework uh, if I understand what you're saying you have you've entered into a, a retainer agreement no you have not you have not well uh, then my advice would be to uh, the, the homework piece of it should come after the representation has been established. And so um, I counsel my client, my students, to never start giving legal advice until the person is a client. Now, under rules in every jurisdiction in the states, um, that counseling session, even before, even before the point that the retainer is signed, that's still confidential. I still have to keep that confidential as a lawyer, even if I, uh, even if I don't retain, even if they don't retain me. But once the uh, retainer is signed, I am then free to start giving legal advice to my client. And it could be in the same meeting. It could be at that point. I don't start giving homework until after that point, unless I'm very clear and say, I don't know whether I have enough information to make a determination as to whether I can help you yet. I need to see this other very relevant document you, you're talking about. And if this is something that I feel I can help you with, then we'll enter into a retainer. That's the only kind of homework that I would give is if I needed more documentation, more information that only the client can provide for me in order for me to determine whether we're going to enter into a representation. Does that make sense? Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, I have one. The ethical issues uh, were asking when you have an interview, a client, until he or she is a client, can give you uh, some confidential information about the issue that um, they need the advice for. So does the, this break any uh, kind of ethical uh, uh, in, the, in the states, it doesn't. As I said, even um, the information that the client is giving you, the story that they're giving you, there may be confidential information that they give you during that time. Um, under our rules of professional conduct, not just in Kansas, but again in any state, that is protected information. A lawyer is obligated not to reveal that to anyone. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's how we deal with it. I don't know if that is different in Georgia. Yes. Can I, Can I ask one question? How it is regulated in Georgia? I mean, do we have special standards? That's why I am going to answer. Uh, so in Georgia, the confidential information is uh, equally pro uh, protected, protected from the information provided by client and information pro provided by person seeking legal advice. It's exact words uh, determined in the law and advocates on law bar. So attorneys feel yes. uh, under obligation to protect this information. Yes. That's identical really to the state. Yeah, that is identical, but not all the lawyers in Georgia are members of our association though, and, and you can seek advice from them. So it's not really identical because, well, I can say a lot of lawyers are not bar association members and are not regulated by that particular law. So. There is still a risk of you know, confidentiality breach anyways, I guess, in Georgia. Okay. And uh, let's make this the last question because I want to make sure that we have time. Uh, I have a quick question. Uh, what happens uh, if uh, uh, you conduct an interview with a prospective client and then go home, think about it, uh, and then finally uh, decide not to uh, represent him? And meanwhile, the issue comes out that there's some urgent need that he, uh, he, he is in need of something uh, really urgent. For example, status of limitations is yes. passes or something like that. But you don't communicate it to the client because you decided not to represent it. Does this 
raise any ethical issues. Maybe that's a question for our for Iraq, but yes, I'll I'll Israel. give you my answer, and then if there, um, I'm I'm happy to uh, have Iraqi uh, to expound on that as well. Um, that's why I think this framework is very important because if you're looking at what do I need to do before I get to the point of actually giving legal advice, is once the client, um, and I, from your scenario, my understanding is that you heard something that was sensitive information, you heard something about the statute of limitations during the client's story, during the client's statement. Yeah, okay. You heard it, but you formed the opinion later when you went home. Mm -hmm. So, um, my, the way that I would handle that is uh, if we get to the end and I'm thinking I don't know whether I want to take on this representation, what I say to the client is, I'm, and I, you have to be transparent about this, um, I don't know whether this is something that I am able or willing to handle for you, but I do want to flag for you that you have an issue that needs immediate attention. Um, I will let you know tomorrow or in a few days, whatever the timetable is, and we give a very specific timetable. Ta time Within 48 hours, we will tell you whether we are taking you on for representation if we don't tell you immediately. And in my clinic, we don't. It's 48 hours. Um, if something needs to be dealt with within that time, I let the client know that this is an immediate need. You either need to let someone else handle it, or I make the decision, I will handle this very discreet issue for the client. But that is the limitation of my scope of representation, and I will do no more. You certainly can in, uh, enter into a very limited scope um, of rep representation and say, I'm handling this one issue because it is immediate and you will be damaged. Part of the reason that we want to deal with those immediate issues is to protect the client from some destructive uh, from damaging uh, him or herself. We want to make sure that we're, what we're doing is in the best interest of the client. So sometimes you deal with that one issue or you refer someone to someone else who can help them for that one issue. But I don't let someone walk out the door um, knowing, with me knowing that there's an immediate issue that needs to be handled and I don't share that with the client. Because they may not be aware of the statute of limitations issue and they're usually not going to be.